Google overlords to let us know it's recording and it is lovely. All right, so um, welcome to today, Thursday, June 9th community call. Uh, and today the focus of our discussion uh, is going to be kind of continuing uh, our, I don't want to call it a series, but uh, of what we've started doing lately, which is just bringing in some folks who are actually building interesting projects out in the world uh, and getting a chance to chat about it here. Uh, and uh, last week we had some of the DSI Labs crew presenting. We had Chris uh, and, and some others from the team. Uh, today we have Darren from Adams.org. Uh, we've had Patrick from Research Hub in the past, and we will be highlighting some more kind of research and DSI groups in the future as well. Uh, so I'll just quickly mention, uh, we're slowly improving the process and at some point in the near future, we will have a way for our community to propose this in a public fashion, given that we're not there just yet, DM me for now if you have any ideas. Uh, and, and we'll kind of work off uh, that lovely manual process until we figure out something more refined. Uh, and just a quick reminder in case anyone has forgot, but uh, yeah, so a week from today, we have, um, uh, we have Antoine presenting on some of his deliberative decision-making research. The week after that, we're gonna have an internal project presentation and we're refining that. But the week after that, which is June 30th, and hopefully this is a surprise to no one, uh, but we have David Ehrlichman coming in for the discussion on the Impact Networks book, uh, which is following our book club session with him, uh, without him, but our internal book club session that Monday. So I'm gonna start sending out the calendar invite. Uh, everyone should have gotten uh, their ebook already. I will send out the codes for the audio books shortly and the, the physical books are already mailed. So yeah, all of that is in process. Um, and yeah, as always, if anyone has any general scurfy questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to myself or to anyone else who's a core scurfer, hop in our Discord and ask away with any questions. But anyway, that is enough of me generally rambling and the actual point of today's discussion uh, is having a wonderful guest present. So uh, Darren, I will, uh, keep my portion of the intro short, which is that uh, Darren is uh, working on Adams.org and has been thinking about peer review and DSI from a number of angles for a while now. And I'll pass it off to you to both do an intro, and then you can walk us through uh, anything you wanted to and, and and present from the general aspect, and then we'll just have a discussion. Awesome. Thanks, Eugene. Uh, glad to be on the Script Community call. Uh, really excited about the sort of open peer review experiments that you guys have lined up and uh, finding ways to potentially collaborate with the community here. As Eugene mentioned, I've been thinking about sort of mechanisms uh, for improving peer review, which I think is uh, is at the crux of a lot of the uh, challenges that that scientific research faces today. I think both peer review from the uh, publication process of how do we get feedback back to authors of, of new research, how do we get uh, evaluation systems for for these uh, this new research, how do we do curation of new research, but also on the grant making side too. Uh, peer review is a really important process of how grant makers uh, ranging from uh, people at institutions like the NIH to uh, foundations uh, figure out what, what kind of proposals they should fund. And so I think uh, thinking about new mechanisms for how we incentivize uh, and reward reviewers who uh, leave high quality question reviews, I think is at the crux of, of a lot of the sort of um, maybe incentive misalignment challenges in scientific research today. So uh, I mentioned Eugene, I, I, I gave a talk just, just a few weeks back um, at DSI Berlin. I don't know how many folks uh, we're able to catch the, this, that uh, on the stream, but I'm happy to go through some of the slides uh, there and then uh, feel free to interrupt at any, any point to ask questions. Uh, I feel like those slides might be a good kicking off point for, for further discussion around sort of some of the things we've been exploring and, and sort of iterating on from a uh, both product and mechanism design uh, perspective on open decentralized peer review and uh, ideas from the broader SCRF community. So let's see if I can now. Um, Get this uh, presenter. Let's see, presenter. And while you're pulling that up, I'll just say I dropped a link to Adams.org, which is uh, Darren's organizational site. And I'll also drop a link to Darren's full presentation uh, from Berlin in case anyone wants to go back and watch that after today's discussion. But yeah, I'll pass it back to you, Darren. Awesome. So this is, um, yeah, from a couple of weeks ago, really think about sort of the the, the history behind peer review uh, and then also the current state of peer review and, and ways of how we can think about improving it. And I think um, Evan at Protocol Labs often likes to talk about sort of this notion of Chester's as fast of understanding uh, before we try to reform or, or, or remove uh, a system that we don't like today, trying to understand sort of the the origins of that, that system and, and, and what uh, 
things from that system uh, we, we should think about continuing to adapt. And so I think it's useful to kind of go through the history. Uh, and so the sort of canonical, at least, uh, origins that, that are um, often uh, ascribed to peer review date back to like 1665 with the rise of the first journal of philosophical transactions. Um, the, the, the various science historians point to sort of letters that the editor at the time um, wrote uh, asking for help uh, sort of with deliberating on on which which submissions uh, were, were qualified, getting feedback to them, but it was a very ad hoc process, really. In many ways, it, uh, the edit, editor had a, a lot of control uh, of the system, and at that point, um, essentially, kind of unilaterally ran the journals, and 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 so um, it was definitely not a standardized process uh, when the first journals emerged. You know. Uh, three, four hundred years ago, and yeah, there's kind of a fun, funny anecdote. Of even as recent as the uh, early 1900s, Einstein uh, never, ra rarely had to go through peer review when he submitted. And actually, um, in, in the, the, when he submitted to this uh, uh, journal, uh, a paper on gra gravitational waves, actually the editor this time had chosen to send it out to uh, for peer review, um, and uh, the, there they had provided some feedback to Einstein, which he, he did not really uh, take kindly to and wrote this letter back where he, he said that uh, not only did he not authorize them to send it out to the specialist, but he, he saw that there was no reason to address the, the erroneous comments of their anonymous expert. And they and he chose to just publish the paper elsewhere and he never actually published in that journal again. And so um, in many ways, uh, that was not the norm uh, to, to sort of peer review papers. Another sort of uh, example that, that's often mentioned is the uh, famous Watson and Crick paper on, on the structure of DNA um, in Nature 1953. Uh, it, the editor just sort of, again, unilaterally decided to, to accept it without any sort of uh, external refereeing. And uh, he justifies it later on by saying that one, it, it's, its correctness is self-evident, which is kind of an odd thing to say about any sort of science. Uh, uh, what, what does you know? What does self-evident actually mean? And so, um, it, I think th those those are all just to say that peer review is actually a pretty modern um, term and, and phenomenon to 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 be used uh, as a standard for how research is done today in science. And so, um, as a term, it actually doesn't really originate in in the scientific research community it actually comes more from a, a medical community where uh, physicians were doing lots of peer review from uh, between each other on, on sort of medical cases they were looking at and eventually like insurance companies adopt uh, peer review as a way of making sure that sort of the right procedures were, were being done and, and and then using that as a, a a consideration for how they reimburse medical procedures and then it eventually kind of by starting the 1970s really takes off once the academic research community uh, adopts peer review as a term. And a lot of this inflection um, point in terms of the, the rise of peer review comes in part because of uh, accountability, uh, at least in the US, uh, demanded by Congress. And, and so uh, there, there were a lot of controversies around how NSF was funding uh, research um, and what, what kinds of research output was actually being generated by what, what they're funding. And so uh, as a result of this, uh, rise in the demand for accountability this this led to um, sort of standardization and peer review in both the grant making committees um, in, in the u.s as well as in some of the the u.s run journals um, it's interesting to see though actually that even um, the, uh, abroad there, there's still some reluctance or resistance to adopting peer review as recently as 1989 the lancet um, one of the top medical journals uh, mentions here that in the united states they, they're demanding too much of peer review and uh, but the, they kind of rely on the process as sort of this guarantee of truth, and and there's a question of whether um, whether that that is that is the right way to right way to go of essentially having the editors outsource their entire uh, decision making processes to this peer review process. So uh, I think th this context is useful. I think uh, to to kind of understand that actually, uh, while it feels like peer review journals and peer review grants today are, are deeply entrenched in the scientific process, they they are very uh, much modern phenomenon. And so I think that both presents an opportunity to kind of reimagine and redesign um, peer review, but also um, realize that uh, research cultures can change. I think there's often um, may, maybe a, a belief in, in sort of the, the stasis of, of institutions, especially in science, that are very prestige oriented and, and uh, often conservative. And so I think in some ways this in how we do peer review. Um, and, and a lot of this uh, history is actually uh, uh, 
really phenomenal work done by science historian Melinda Baldwin. So uh, I'd highly recommend this book, Making Nature, uh, which is uh, the history of uh, the journal Nature, as well as um, uh, a nice little article, review article she wrote uh, a few years ago about sort of the rise of peer review um, in the US. So that's sort of the QR code to that um, article if you guys want to read more. Uh, but I kind of want to jump ahead to sort of thinking about peer review today, uh, how, how it operates, sort of the, the challenges it presents, um, because this is, I think, what, what motivates a, a lot of us in this community is, is thinking about how do we actually reform a system that ha has uh, reached a point where, where there are a lot of uh, various misaligned incentives. So uh, there was an estimate uh, last year or two years ago uh, looking at just how much peer review was essentially donated by researchers, as, as I think many in the community know, uh, at least on the uh, publication front, most journals uh, elect to uh, rely entirely on volunteer uh, peer reviewers. And this is a, a, a fairly burdensome task. And, and uh, there, is, there is an estimate that over 100 million hours of global peer review was donated in 2020. And so this is, um, this is something that uh, researchers sort of uh, don't don't uh, get recognized for both financially or or from a reputation standpoint. That makes it um, a potentially cha challenging uh, friction point in, in the process today. Um, there was actually a nice survey done by Publons, uh, which was uh, trying to build a sort of a uh, peer review reputation platform um, a few years ago, looking at why people actually did chose to do peer review. Then, despite these, as they say, comparatively weak incentives and recognition, and a lot of people, forty percent, you know, the uh, plurality of people. Uh, view it as just part of their job as a researcher, and and you know that, and so they they feel the need to reciprocate reviews uh, for others. Um, and that uh, some some use it as as a mechanism for just keeping up to date with the literature. That was about thirty three percent, or a third of researchers. Um, others wanted to make sure that they actually had a role in in uh, sort of gatekeeping and ensuring the quality of research. I've talked to a lot of professors myself who, when I asked them why why do they uh, choose to donate all this time to, to doing peer review when they could be doing, you know, their own original research or uh, things. And, and they talk about how they themselves have published in, in these same journals and they, don't, they want to make sure that the quality of those journals that they have sort of uh, put their pu publications and time into uh, ha have a high standard so that their, their own work doesn't uh, get diluted in terms of brand or prestige going forward. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, almost um, recursive uh, incentive in, in some ways. And so uh, the, I think the, the survey uh, is relatively comprehensive in terms of how, how many researchers they're, uh, they're, they're uh, asking around the world and get, gets, gets a good sense of some of the challenges too in terms of editors uh, having a really hard time, uh, you know, three quarters of editors by finding uh, reviewers uh, being a big, big bottleneck in, in the process and there being uh, just increasing sort of, um, uh, delays in terms of just the, the amount of effort it takes to find a qualified peer reviewer who's willing to take the time to review um, articles. So uh, a lot of these point to some of the sort of um, challenges that we could think about fixing with an open peer review system um, or, or, or perhaps a more decentralized peer review system. Um, there's also a question of does peer review actually work that well uh, today? There, there have been a lot of uh, sort of case studies of how peer review is actually gate kept uh, sort of innovative high risk uh, reward research that just ha uh, hasn't quite been recognized in its time as being as having the impact and and so this this was a jamma piece from uh, you know almost 30 years ago uh, talking about all these case studies of really high impact uh, research articles that just did not get published whether it was uh, you know the Krebs cycle uh, the identification of the lymphocytes um, a lot of these um, really top uh, seminal findings uh, were kind of rejected by the peer reviewers at the beginning. And, and there's a question of how do we actually incentivize the reviewers to want to make uh, sort of most prescient decisions when it comes to uh, reviewing both the publications in this, on this front. Um, and this is another sort of case study of the challenges that uh, you know a lot, a lot of the folks working on uh, the uh, uh, COVID-19 vaccine previously had with just figuring out a, a very, uh, key part of uh, the, the sort of structural tweak that would be needed to design the spike protein. Uh, again, had a hard time ever getting this thing published um, and just getting it rejected everywhere, but at, at least they got, got it onto, onto, the, uh, onto the market via, via clinical trials. So um, there, there's really a question around how do we incentivize reviewers to not only provide high quality reviews, but uh, 
be willing to sort of um, not just just have um, conservative critical reviews, but also uh, be be incentivized to to have prescient reviews of um, of sort of high impact research. There's also um, uh, s some interesting literature recently on how much change happens between preprints that are submitted with no peer review and then the final papers that have gone through the entire journal uh, peer review process. And uh, this was uh, particularly a, a useful exercise during COVID where uh, the large majority of papers were just being pu uh, pushed out onto preprint servers uh, almost instantly. And uh, that created a, a large data set to start comparing those that were uh, submitted to places like BioArchive and MedArchive and then tracking how much how many changes were made in the in the papers themselves once they were uh, accepted and, and published by journals and really um, there there was a, a relatively minor change generally between the preprints and published articles which again suggests that maybe uh, even as a feedback platform um, peer review is not accomplishing that much and in, instead um, it's mostly useful as a, a credentialing platform today um, I also want to talk a little bit about on the, on the grant review side, where, as I mentioned, NIH uh, review, re, reviews uh, grants using uh, using these sort of uh, peer committees and uh, does uh, a lot of extensive sort of percentile based scoring. And essentially, uh, uh, most of the research shows that uh, once you get above a, a certain sort of basic threshold, in this case, uh, once you get kind of above the 20th percentile of grants, there isn't really um, much predictable predictiveness in terms of how productive uh, researchers are um, based on those grant reviews. And so there's, again, a question of how do we actually, um, well, one, given how burdensome both the grant application processes and the grant review processes, how do we, um, how, how do we actually make that process um, useful so that we're, that if, if there is a high burden that the ultimate research output that comes out of that burden is actually uh, as, as impactful as possible. Um, and, and again, there's often very high variance among reviewers when they're even reviewing the same grant, grant applications, uh, which perhaps isn't surprising. I think there, there's um, always a question of whether uh, there, what, what, does, what does the sort of consensus mean in, in er, really early stage research? It's, it's difficult, but in some ways this, this may uh, sh show that there's just a, a lack of sort of robustness and reproducibility in terms of how review happens today. And if we're relying heavily on review to be the gatekeeping step, then that, that may actually be a bad filter for the kinds of research that gets done. Um, the other po point I think that, that's uh, emerging as an interesting contrast to the sort of uh, formalized peer review mechanisms is the sort of uh, online commentary that can be generated. This this is sort of, uh, I think, an interesting case study of uh, a grad student at the time um, who posted uh, just, you know, a few paragraphs on a, on a comment on Tyler Cowen's blog uh, in response to Thomas Piketty's uh, book Capital at the time, pointing out a potential miscalculation in terms of how Piketty uh, incorporated depreciation, and it led to this grad student being invited to uh, submit a paper to the uh, Brookings Institution, and and it shows kind of the power of potential open review, not only for providing feedback to the original author or for curating the, the right kind of research, but as uh, a sort of uh, a powerful research artifact in of itself, where re providing a high quality review can elevate um, a young researcher or, uh, or somebody who who, um, who has done uh, quite a bit of sort of reproduction or uh, reanalysis of existing research. And so I think this kind of points to the promise of uh, kind of more open peer review systems, helping to develop and accrue reputation to the reviewers themselves. Um, there's also uh, places like PubPeer, which are used by uh, folks in the biomedical community, mostly to spot fraud. Uh, in terms of finding uh, images that have been fa fabricated, and it, it provides a venue for for um, for post-publication peer review, where journal editors uh, or even the reviewers themselves often aren't uh, looking carefully at the the source data themselves, but there are these sort of um, sleuths now that that are out there lo looking at potential fraudulent images, and so uh, I think there are more and more venues for uh, enabling people to. Uh, leave open review and Elizabeth Vick, uh, who, who's sort of pointed out both both of these um, problematic images, has kind of built a reputation now as somebody who is almost just a full-time uh, fraud reviewer. 
And it's interesting, there actually are often financial um, uh, potential uh, or sort of financial um, ramifications here. Those, both those papers that I, I mentioned there were actually sort of foundational papers for biotech companies. And shortly after some of these uh, comments went out, there, there were sort of massive changes in uh, the the public stock prices of these small cap biotech companies. And this is a bit relevant to some of the conversations we were generally having in DCI Berlin, which is a question of how much uh, decentralized science uh, should or could be financialized and, and does that provide uh, various uh, new misaligned incentives. But in the case of, uh, of sort of biomedical research where there's clear intellectual property and a clear sort of clinical commercial development strategy, these may provide um, uh, financial incentives for, for people. Elizabeth Bick herself actually uh, famously does not uh, ever involve herself financially, but there are others uh, such as these physicians who uh, both had a short position and then also uh, co-wrote a, pe a petition to the FDA alleging manipulation in these papers. Um, so I think it's an interesting case study again for thinking about financial incentives for, for peer review. Um, and I guess the, the last sort of section I'll cover is some, some new experiments around uh, peer review. Um, for To sort of nature's credit, they actually tried um, 15, 16 years ago an open uh, review trial where they essentially, you can read here, they, they uh, took um, a lot of the authors that would have submitted to nature, asked them if they'd be uh, uh, willing to su subject themselves to an open review process where anybody uh, online could uh, leave comments and a large majority of them cho chose not to. I mean, I think you can see here, they sent out a total of 1,400 papers, only about 5% or 70 of those authors agreed for their papers to be displayed for open review. Only about half of those um, 38 or so received comments. And those um, uh, th those those comments um, ended up being somewhat helpful um, generally, or uh, in a few, few uh, been very helpful to the um, original researchers. But again, it points to this challenge of how do you actually elicit um, contributions uh, from reviewers to actually want to op openly review these things? How do you actually get uh, researchers on board uh, and being being willing? Again, this was sort of 15, 16 years ago. So norms and, and uh, dynamics have changed, but I think it was an interesting sort of case study on, on nature's front and, and, and shows at least their willingness to some extent to play around with new mechanisms. Um, obviously in the AI community, they, they've been doing open review for conference submissions for a while now. And, and that has had, um, well, I, the, there's actually quite a bit of literature around how well that works in terms of both the inter-reviewer um, reliability as well as um, uh, possible uh, sources of bias. And, and so there's quite a bit of literature there. I, I, uh, I had meant to link it, but if anyone's interested, I'm happy to link some of the, the sort of meta research on open review. Um, people have also explored replication markets uh, as a way to kind of estimate how uh, robust and reliable scientific research is. And uh, mo mo most of these um, replication markets uh, have shown that people have quite a bit of predictive power to estimate the quality of scientific research. So kind of relying on, on more of a, uh, a crowd-based approach to, to evaluate um, the quality of research. Um, DARPA itself is actually quite interested in this, uh, given how much sort of uh, policy and social science uh, research that, that, that they fund, and especially with some of the questions around the robustness of uh, psychology research. And so they've held several uh, large contests where it's not just sort of a toy replication market, but there, there's actually um, real prizes and, and rewards on the line. And, and some of those experiments have wrapped up recently. Um, uh, there, there's also folks who, who even uh, set up sort of a COVID-19 preprint prediction market. I think that has just um, resolved those markets and, and there, there should be some interesting research coming out of there, there as well. Um, so, uh, oh, and then there's, there's one more experiment in terms of uh, thinking about distributed review, where essentially you can imagine um, having, uh, uh, spreading the burden of peer review among the people who are submitting research themselves. This is actually a program that the NSF had started uh, about eight, nine years ago as a trial to take uh, the folks who were uh, submitting proposals to actually act as reviewers as well. And they were trying to uh, design various mechanisms so that people wouldn't collude and people wouldn't sort of uh, 
act in sort of malicious ways to kind of downvote their colleagues such that their uh, papers uh, or their proposals got got the most funding. And so there's some sort of uh, in interesting uh, game theory and mechanism design space for thinking about how we could do a more collective peer review, uh, almost as sort of a, a club of people who are all submitting and all reviewing papers collectively. Um, and then th there's also been sort of uh, on the grant side uh, initiatives now to use scouts to go out um, rather than sort of get inbound submissions that you review, you actually empower people to go out and, and find um, research that you think is promising. Uh, the Survival and Flourishing Fund recently had an interesting speculation grant round where they uh, uh, empowered people like Scott Aarons and the, the, um, the, the, to, to go out and find uh, projects that he himself uh, would uh, solicit through sort of his community on his blog, essentially, uh, as kind of an open uh, process for, for doing uh, grant review and grant funding. Uh, there's recently also uh, a fund called Hypothesis Fund that got started to empower other uh, professors to go out and directly uh, fund compelling uh, early stage research that would be otherwise underfunded. Um, these are some slides actually that uh, uh, Philip at DSide Labs, who might have presented last week, uh, uh, put together for, for the conference, just thinking about uh, this quadrant of, of peer review um, and thinking about whether we can balance the the the, the challenges of highly rigorous uh, research along with highly novel research, which often uh, has sort of a, a tension there. Uh, we had some really good conversation in, in Berlin around whether there, there was uh, maybe even a strict trade-off between the kinds of folks who are doing really high, high novelty research and worry about kind of getting scooped and worry about getting the research out as possible, as fast as possible, uh, and, and the trade-off between sort of take, uh, taking time to do a lot more rigorous, reproducible research and uh, what, whether there's some way of incentivizing both at the same time or whether it's actually uh, kind of best done through a bifurcated system where you have some folks who are doing the really high, high, um, high risk novel research publishing sort of as fast as possible. And then there's sort of another group of people who are, are really focused on uh, reproducing, extending, expanding, translating um that the the novel research um uh, so just something worth thinking about and then i think we had just some open questions uh that we posed uh and i think would be interesting to pose the community here to think about uh sort of what what are the the ways of finding and incentivizing the right qualified reviewers what well, you know one of the challenges that we mentioned both with the nature open review uh the experiment that they, they tried as well as uh the sort of uh Ch challenges of e existing editors today from the, the Publon survey I mentioned. Um, there's really a big, big question. I think maybe maybe the crux of the question is how do we actually evaluate the quality of the reviews? Right now, we rely on editors essentially to use their sort of scientific judgment uh, to find the reviewers and, and uh, ensure that the reviews they're providing are actually high quality. But you know, there, there's often complaints that from researchers that the reviewers are, are, are missing par parts of their research or are too fixated on, on, on my, my new detail. And so there's a question of how do we actually go about evaluating the quality of reviews? There, there's almost kind of like an, uh, uh, a recurse problem in some ways of, you know, who reviews reviewers and then who reviews the people who review the reviewers. And so uh, finding the right sort of product and mechanism design there is, is a challenge. There's also a question of how much we should view um, peer review as a process of consensus building versus uh, peer review should be a process where we should um, uh, encourage and find reviewers who are willing to kind of take those more contrarian, perhaps prescient bets, as I mentioned earlier, with a lot of the, the high risk, high impact research that often gets overlooked um, by, both, by both journals and by grant committees. And so how do we actually find the right balance of, you know, a consensus driven approach versus maybe a more conviction driven approach? Um, as mentioned on the previous slides that uh, Philip made, how do we actually move peer review into like this uh, prog this quadrant of uh, of achieving both rigor while also uh, producing high impact novel research? And then, really, I think the thing that perhaps this community is most excited about is like, what are some uh, Web three native mechanisms and review reputation and rewards that can be applied to scientific peer review? I think there's a lot of things uh, that can be done to sort of elicit um, more open, transparent reviews while still um, ensuring the privacy of the reviewers in a way that we can actually have uh, hopefully the most um, impactful reviews and then perhaps uh, flowing both reputation and, and financial incentives to those who are leading these high quality reviews. So uh, with that, I, I kind of stop there. I'm happy to kind of talk about some of the 
the things that we've been iterating on from sort of uh, product and mechanism design standpoint, would love to kind of uh, explore ideas from the community here at SCURF, um, address any sort of questions, but um, happy to have a pretty open-ended conversation now. Yeah, no, first off, thank you so much for presenting that, Darren. That was awesome. And we will have many general conversations together to follow on this. But in this public recorded medium, I want to strongly encourage everyone to, yeah, please raise your hand if you want to jump on audio and actually ask a question. Uh, if you can't or just don't want to get on audio, feel free to drop it in chat and I will read those off. Uh, but yeah, I see Rich already has his virtual hand up, so please jump in. You are still muted, though. I said, of course, I have my hand up because I cannot control myself. So uh, thanks, Darren. That was an amazing presentation. Can can How hard would it be to show you, get you to show us that last slide again? I want to take a look at the open questions for a second. I should be. See, um, um, I, I'm a technologist, not an academic. And so I have a tendency to maybe heavily rely on technological solutions for things. Um, and I want to get your feedback here. So finding and incentivizing the right qualified reviewers and evaluating quality of reviews, um, rewarding consensus and contrarianism, these are things that can be built into sort of a mechanism behind closed doors where a group of individuals get together and apply the principles and, and try to um, solve for these problems. There's another option, though, when we're looking at things from an open peer review perspective, I keep on casting my mind back to marketplaces of ideas and, and reviews and stuff. And, because the technology thing, I, it's not the greatest example in the world, but there's a thing called Stack Exchange in the dev world. And um, there's a lot of very, very clever and largely rude individuals, but uh, clever nonetheless that do a great deal of work um, reviewing and commenting and providing information simply for the reward of having a number go up on their profile page. These are very, very dedicated individuals and their past reviews are open and it, it's a system that seems to work. And I think that the reason why it works is because there's a reputational marketplace in effect here. Um, do you think that the first three bullet points here could potentially be solved by having an open reviewable marketplace of actors where People can create reputation. Um, uh, people can select on which answers they uh, like or do not like, or whether they consider their questions solved or unsolved. Or is that adding more ethical problems to the uh, already thorny ethical problems that are that exist here? Yeah, no, I think it's it's a really good um, sort of case study for how open reputation review systems ha have worked really well to kind of create this uh, knowledge base. I, I think there's. Uh, in the uh, sort of Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange model, it, it's um, primarily oriented around sort of like um, question and answer. And so there's a, uh, I'm curious how well that generalizes to um, other sort of uh, modes of knowledge inquiry and knowledge sharing. Um, you know, uh, another sort of case study people point to often is Wikipedia is sort of this open uh, review, curation, knowledge layer. Um, and whether science could be sort of put in, in this uh, more wikified place, or is it viewed in more of a question and answer place? I know actually um, ResearchGate uh, for, for a long time, I actually haven't been following lately, but uh, ResearchGate uh, as sort of an academic, a scientific social network for a long time was starting to orient themselves around sort of a question and answer system. Um, and uh, it was, um, but, but part of the challenge was it often got stuck in very sort of basic, uh, sort of rudimentary lab protocols. It never got to a point where it was sort of, it got uh, where the sort of discourse in, in the community of research gate got to a point where it was sort of high prestige original research discourse. And so there's sort of a, and um, in some ways, I guess Stack Overflow is often uh, somebody who do, doesn't really code these days, but it is often used as more of a good sort of uh, repository of sort of information for people try, trying to get like very tactical uh, help on, on, on some, some sort of engineering challenge. Um, there's a question of like how much sort of um, original uh, research work would fit well into that model. Um, and so, uh, but I think it's a really useful uh, sort of primitive to think about these open reputation systems that encourage people to kind of share so much knowledge publicly or, and, and distribute that. So. Um, I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful thing to look into. I, I probably should spend more time 
looking at sort of the, their reputation design mechanisms. I, I spent a little bit of time a few months ago, but it's worth taking a closer look. Beyond, beyond the simple frame, like Stack Exchange definitely is a place where you just go find the answer to a problem and then move on. Um, it can be framed uh, to re-architect it as opposed to support you know, more of a longer form um, uh, peer review type processes. But it's the notion that this open reputation model marketplace um, seems to have a high level of engagement. And maybe if um, some kind of financial incentives were aligned on top of that based on reputation um, and was focused towards peer review itself. It's just, uh, I keep on casting back to the question of whether a marketplace might be the solution to these these problems. Like, I hesitate to say it, but if, if all the reviews and all the reviewers and all the uh, author, original authors were all sorting out the question of how do we uh, promote or disincentivize good and bad reviews, maybe the marketplace will figure it out itself. Um, and that's not something that needs to be guided by uh, a hand somewhere. Do you think that's realistic or is that naive? I think it's plausible and I think it's it's worth uh, running the experiment. Actually, I mean, in the Stack Exchange example, they still have sort of um, a sort of guiding hand in terms of how the like reputation economy works, if I understand, right? I don't know if like, every sort of like Stack Exchange community, like Stack Overflow versus like Math Overflow versus other ones have different reputation mechanism designs. Actually, that would be kind of interesting as a, as a meta research thing to study to like what the reputation economy flows, uh, how, how those actually affect different um, different interactions. But, um, but I do think there is still a little bit of like um, top downness from my, my understanding in terms of how they like assign you know, uh, a certain upvote or whatever on Stack Overflow to get uh, accrue so much reputation, so, uh, you know, a particular amount of reputation. Um, they uh, posting a comment or asking a question accrues uh, some amount of reputation. So um, I would be curious to see like how much, uh, how, how sensitive is the overall mo model to those parameters? All right, well, and I could dig into this for hours, but I'll see the floor. I think we have more hands coming up now. Eugene was about to do that for me. <laughs> I mean, you do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really interesting one. And I also wonder how much the, um, did the culture precede the incentives in those environments where there are good examples of where it works? And did you find 20 people where it works, slap on an incentive and then scale that or vice versa? That'd be interesting to look into as well. But Chris, you had your, uh, Chris Bates, you had your hand up first. So please jump on in. Yes, thank you very much for this presentation. Um, I'm wondering if we have a chicken and egg problem with reputation in that the journal structure has been the predominant way of researchers, scientists, uh, academics to gain reputation by getting into publications. Whereas now, if we've come to a point where we've all said the, I mean, not, not everyone, but there's some sort of acknowledgement that just being in a journal by proxy does not guarantee that the quality of the research is necessarily beneficial to the field. Does the open peer review, is the onus trying to improve the integrity of the entire field or is the focus on trying to improve the quality of publications? Because I think those things have been conflated. So if we try to disambiguate, I'm not sure that we can do one without reinforcing the notion of journalist supremacy over information. And if we're trying to actually open up the integrity of information, funneling reviews into the journal process does not necessarily seem to me to be the best way to break from that paradigm. So that's why I'm trying to figure out is the goal to break away from journals having the highest reputation over information within a field or to make it so that journals are more open access because I'm not sure that both can necessarily be achieved and have the same end. Yeah, no, I think that's a really, really great point, Chris. In some ways, there's a question of like, what are the problems that we're trying to solve here with, with um, how research gets published and shared today? Um, some of it, I think, uh, especially in the biomedical 
um, and sort of, uh, I think in the economics fields, um, less than the computer science and physics fields, uh, is around open access. Is like, can, can we actually just, uh, you know, break through what, uh, you know, the co copyright issues of, of publications today and, you know, the not, scientific knowledge should be a, a public good that is accessible to everyone. So I think that's one, one piece. There's another piece around sort of the economics, the uh, structure of how publishing works today, where the researchers themselves have to pay to, to get published. Um, the universities have to pay to subscribe to the journals. Uh, the reviewers don't get paid anything. And also there's like some economic friction that, to solve. There's also a, a question around um, uh, incentives of the, the quality and the impact of research uh, around the sort of replication crisis, uh, the incentives to have researchers share uh, sort of negative results, share uh, to, to be able to publish replication data, uh, to encourage uh, the original researchers to sh share their methods and uh, data and code in a way that it's more reproducible. Um, so there's a piece I think that's around uh, how do we actually promote higher quality research being done and then there's sort of last piece of what does like um or there's there's a few last pieces in terms of like how do you get, actually do a review process that still gets uh, really good feedback to the uh, original authors if we're not going to go through the gatekeeping um, journal mechanisms or how do we actually curate the most relevant uh impactful research again if we don't go through this sort of um gate kept journal mechanism so i think in some ways as you mentioned there's like a lot of problems that, that are kind of being conflated here uh, and, and thinking about very tactically about which of those uh, are being solved with, with which particular tools or solutions I think is is really important. Um, so um, in, in my mind, um, all those things are important in, in some ways I think it's it's uh, really exciting to have this ecosystem of uh, different DSAC projects all working on sort of different pieces of this because I think in some ways it's, it's a massive problem and, and, and part of this sort of ways that journals have been entrenched is that they they actually solve all to some extent try to solve all these problems in one big bundle system and so to kind of provide a credible alternative we need different pieces that address each of these issues uh, at least as well if not much better than how the status quo works today yeah thank you for that answer i know chris hill had his hand up next Christopher, if you want to jump in. Good to see you, Chris. Hey, good to see you, Darren. Thanks a lot for uh, joining the community, Colin, for the presentation. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, I'm really curious to, to hear more about the types of mechanisms you guys are working on. If you could, uh, if you could uh, uh, tell us a bit about that and how you're thinking about the problem. What are, like, let's say, you know, now that we've mapped out the landscape, the history of peer review, the challenges associated with that, what are some of the, in your opinion, most promising mechanisms and how they can be implemented and what are you guys doing about it? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that we've been spending a lot of time kind of figuring out is how, how do we do, how do we elicit sort of uh, the the most prescient reviews? And and in some ways there's this trade-off as we've talked about and various other DSI things around privacy versus transparency. And is there a way of doing reputation where people can review, review things honestly without fear of retribution, uh, still accrue reputation, um, and do it in a way where there's um, where 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 you can balance that both the honesty of the reviews and, and and the privacy. So we've been kind of iterating on a few different designs, and some of them gotten too complicated. Which is uh, the, you know there I think some interesting sort of zero knowledge based mechanisms that that we we kind of explored and thought about for a bit that uh, may be a little bit over engineered at this point. But there, I think part of the challenge in some ways is um, figuring out how do we one um, do this uh, balance between privacy and transparency, as I mentioned. Two, how do we actually have people evaluate the reviewers? And who are the people who actually do that? Is that a, a community of trusted high prestige people to kind of get the system rolling? But then there, there are sort of questions around equity there. And and even, I, I mean, we, we're at the uh, Decentralized Society talk together in Berlin. There's a question of like, if we give the existing prestige holders all the, all, all, all the credentials sort of to serve as meta reviewers that, that there, there is always gonna be some question around what, whether we're, we're sort of just forking the existing system without improving things. And so kind of creating open evaluation systems um, for the reviews is challenging. One of the things that we've also been kind of playing around from both kind of a mechanism and product design perspective is sort of regular retroactive um, reviews. So, you know, uh, every N 
you know, months or years going back and checking and seeing who are the, who, what are the quality of the reviews from, you know, that, that time ago, how do, how, can we sort of like imagine airdropping the, the sort of collectively agreed upon best reviews now? So I think the consensus versus contrarianism thing is actually a very important part of the sort of product mechanism design here, where mm -hmm. at the beginning, actually, I think you, you may want to uh, have a system that permits contrarianism, but I think over the long term, sort of long arc of sort of truth kind of gets, gets revealed through consensus. And so um, take the example of modified mRNA research in the 90s was, was deeply un, unpopular as, as something that was scientifically feasible or scientifically worth pursuing. And that meant that Catalan Carrico was struggled deeply to get, uh, get grants and, and, and later to get, get published for the work she was doing. But now sort of 15 years later that we, we've reached a place where, where clearly uh, the sort of technology that she and Drew Weissman built were deeply impactful. And so this is where we have prizes, you know, like things like the Nobel Prize as sort of essentially the retroactive mechanism. And I think we, we need many more retroactive mechanisms for doing that. So that's another piece yeah. that we've been kind of playing around yeah, with. Yeah, ha having some sort of accountability system. Um, yeah. And another thing that I actually, that I think you brought up first to our attention, which I, which I think is, is a really interesting take, is that there's two attitudes to POV. One of them is the adversarial attitude, which is a default attitude right now. It's like, I'm the gatekeeper. Why should this person with this work be allowed in my community? Because journals are communities, right? They're communities of professionals with certain, with deep expertise, right? And so you come in with the mindset that there's no way this is coming in, right? And then you're evaluated based on that. You look for like all the reasons why this should not be part of, the, of, the, of that community, essentially of that club. Um, and one of the things is like, hey, uh, we can dissociate the feedback phase and the draft improvement phase in the phase about, hey, what would it take to make this work really, really good according to the standards of X and Y communities? You know, as a distinct phase from, hey, now you're getting curated. Now within, you know, community X, we're going to decide whether your work is good or not, right? Maybe you have uh, more thoughts on this and, and uh, you know, ideas about mechanism designs or what you've been thinking about it. Yeah, in some ways, uh, the feedback thing, uh, I feel like it's easy to tempt it down like rabbit holes and mechanisms. And I actually think the feedback thing, um, more and more, you see people just sort of, uh, you have trusted colleagues that, that you can just use email, right? And, and I don't know if there needs to be like uh, a, and a, a deep sort of um, need to sort of find find the the feedback with like very elaborate mechanism design there's also the thing where you know if you post something online and and it challenges somebody else's view you'll you, you'll definitely get the feedback sort of pretty pretty quickly without any any sort of like really elaborate uh, reward structure and so i think um i think the feedback thing in some ways um i don't know i don't want to trivialize it i think it's, it's an important problem and, and i think there are a lot of researchers uh, probably i think there are probably researchers especially in new spaces where there aren't um the same sort of venues like conferences and, and, and things to kind of get early feedback on, on your work. Uh, but I do think there are sort of like informal mechanisms to just kind of generally solve the feedback thing. Um, the, the, the curation thing is, 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 is trickier in some ways. And there's a question of like, uh, and there, there's a whole era in like kind of the 20th century era of like token curated registries and ways to have people sort of collectively uh, choose which lists uh, and which rankings within a list are are most salient. I think there's actually probably a lot of interesting mechanism design space there uh, around how do you actually reward the curators and graph protocols and like interesting curation stuff. Yeah, have you thought about quadratic curation? The idea of quadratic funding or quadratic voting applied to curation of scientific work? It could be interesting where essentially people are allocated certain like points per week to like you know, uh, retweet a paper or something, something like that. And so, um, uh, or upvote a paper. I think this, uh, mechanisms like that could, could be very interesting. Obviously, like the folks at Research Arbor are using sort of like um, upvote, downvote based mechanisms where uh, I guess with fork of steam, there's, there's some maybe tokenomics there. Um, and so they're, they're probably actually, I think there is probably a wide uh, design space. I actually think a lot of the decentralized like social network um, experiments like Lens Protocol and some of these others will, probably uh, actually have a lot of teachings to think about how do you actually curate content in ways where the content career curators are um, better rewarded um, than the current sort of 
Web two playbooks, but I think it's uh it's that that there's a lot of interesting product design and, and mechanisms and design space there. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Christopher, for those questions. And Umar, I know you got your hand up next. Please jump in. Uh thanks, Darren, for a fantastic presentation. I think that was some of the most uh information per second uh that I've uh kind to receive. So I really appreciate that. And uh I had a question about um sort of uh you know there's been a lot of discussion recently about the DSOC paper and plurality um and i'm curious how if at all you see that being applied to journals like would a paper maybe go seek acceptance or rejection from a plurality of journals slash agencies rather than just one um and sort of accrue reputation as like you know not just like one stamp or credential but like um a, a stack of them and then maybe secondarily to that question um, in, in terms of like incentives for the journal or the reviewer to contribute, um, what do you think about giving them like co-authorship or something similar to that when reviewing? Yeah, those are really great uh, questions and ideas there. I think uh, the plurality, plurality thing is interesting. In some ways, um, there's a question of what does plurality mean? Does plurality mean multiple journals being accepted? Does it plurality mean multiple um, dimensions that a, a paper gets vetted on actually like uh, a lot of stuff that Chris and uh, and the rest of the DSA labs folks are doing in terms of like badge integration for for papers and enabling that metadata to be surface this notion of could you get a badge uh, that you know you did the pre-registration of your paper so that's sort of a plurality credential it's not you know you're getting into the journal of pre-registered studies but maybe all, all you need is just uh, to have uh, satisfied that the pre-registration requirement um maybe there's also you've gone through the i don't know uh the vetting that that you uh kept all your data open and that that's another sort of uh credential or or badge that, that that's on the paper so i think there's um so that that's another approach to, to think about plurality is one that is um not necessarily viewed through the lens of journals but through the lens of like what are the various um ways to to uh vet a piece of research as being credible you could imagine even different curators um, curating it, uh, curating uh, some re research paper artifact, and each different curator, uh, you know, putting their stamp of approval on it as a different sort of pl pl uh, plur plural kind of vetting mechanism, rather than have one journal that relies on like two or three reviewers be the sort of arbiter. You have like a community of people, and you can imagine sort of like web of trust systems, which is another sort of Mechanism and project design thing that we played around with, where you have uh, more more or less trusted uh, intermediaries in your circle who have uh, read or approved or, or vetted a, a paper, and so I think um, the 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 mental model of plurality plurality is a really really powerful one here. Um, you also asked about reviewers and giving reviewers more credit, and I think this is um, yeah a really interesting thing around. How do we recognize the uh, reviewers in a way, uh, especially if they're providing um, really, uh, there's a question of like what, what the reviewers are doing. So I think curators, um, like if we unbundle reviewers very, very just uh, crudely into curators and feedback providers, the curators, you can imagine them occurring reputation and things for the people that follow them or, you know, that they're, they're, they're in some ways like Twitter already acts as a sort of at least science curation network, depending on who you follow um and, and so the curators kind of uh they can derive some some benefit from being being effective curators of science the feedback people i think that that there's a question of how, how and where do they get attributed to uh in in the paper uh, often uh you know in like sort of casual blog posts you see people acknowledge the readers and people who provide, provided feedback um occasionally people can provide uh feedback that's so strong that it, it promotes, you know, a new um, uh, line uh, area of research or, or a totally new experiment. Um, sometimes you can imagine feedback leading to collaborations. Um, how do you actually attribute that? I think is is generally kind of a, a broader question of how do you attribute um, collective effort in, in a, a public domain like science? Like there's always questions around authorship, who counts as an author, what is the ordering of, of the authors, um, you know, what, which, how many, you know, what, what is the way to calibrate which authors in, in the list of um, researchers get um, get more or less credit? 
And so I think the, there's a sort of more general attribution thing in science that we could talk about, but may, maybe we can table that for, for another time. Thanks. Thank you, Umar. I'll ask a quick follow-up to that because my question was actually very similar to what Umar brought up from the plurality perspective. And if we do, uh, if sort of envisioning a future with a pluralistic approach where there are multiple agencies that are all uh, running as public goods doing peer review, either by domain or by approach, where some could be expert curated, some could be crowdsourced curated. Like, do you see that as one potential version of the plurality of peer review of kind of peer review as a public good agency is taking their own bet of like, well, this is the approach we take. Here's all of our process and documentation. You let us know if you want us to review your stuff. And we're one of the many badges you can accumulate. And I, I don't know, what are your thoughts in that direction? Yeah, that's a really uh, good question. And I think the maybe the the trade-off or the maybe counter counterpoint to uh, like a highly plural universe is like a universe with standards, right? And standards create sort of shelling points for how people evaluate and do things. I think standards are important. Uh, you know, you don't want USB A through Z, you know, uh, and so I think sta standards for science will emerge as important. You know, uh, any arbitrary badge may end up uh, speaking of reputation. Um, you know, reputation is something that is a shelling point uh, of attention. And so so having sort of an understanding of how standards are, are, are created and, and potentially evolved um, in this hopefully plural universe but one where there are still a few shelling points because i think naturally we need those shelling points um is, is something worth considering and so i think a lot of that ultimately will uh there's a question of like in this incentive loop um both from a financial incentive and a reputational incentive standpoint who's the audience right and i think that goes potentially to a lot of the grant making agencies maybe hiring agencies um and they they are the ones who at the end of the day have to care to a large extent what these badges are doing, what the journals are. And so how do you shift them into a system where they care about um, the, these new credentials, I think is a, a, a very challenging sort of problem. And in some ways it may require new new funders, new institutions uh, to adopt some of these uh, new credential systems before they actually are viable as a sort of a, a plural source of, um, uh, of credibility. Absolutely. And I know we're about to hit or at time in a couple of minutes. So I just want to make sure to give uh, the last person who's raising their hand and is uh, first time joining our community cause, I believe, but Kaido, please jump in. I see you also just dropped a comment. I don't know if that's the same or not, but no, please feel free to jump in with your question. Yeah, I was just talking about authorship. Hi, Darren. Great to meet everyone. And uh, a quick question about momentum. So I think science carry forward a lot of momentum and the system is designed for a certain way. So what do you think about like, like, how do you think about overcoming that momentum and to introduce something new to the system? That's a great question. I mean, there, there's, uh, you know, in some ways we're against, uh, as I kind of described in this manifesto, like uh, sort of both uh, a monopoly and monopsony at the same point, right? Like we have a monopoly on how information or all adopting on how information is shared and we have sort of a monopsony in terms of how information is bought, uh, scientific research is bought. And so there's a question of like, how do we, um, how do we shift that monopsony? And there, there are case studies like HHMI, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, they pioneered uh, some new new mechanisms for funding researchers in a way that they were drawing some of the best talent out of the NIH pool. Not, I mean, they're not mutually exclusive, but it forced the NIH to respond with a new program. And so the, there can be ways to compete, um, especially when you have funding. I mean, HHMI is uh, endowed with like $20 billion. And so they're, they're not a small, small funder themselves. I think another place is to really verticalize around areas where there is um, underappreciated research, and this is something I know uh, Chris at DCI Labs and I have talked about is like thinking about new new research verticals like meta research, um, or thinking about sort of like more Web3 native research communities where there is not the same um, stasis and established uh, academic um, conservative institutions already, and there might be an opportunity to build like new research communities and, and institutions there. I think. The, uh, actually, one of the really interesting case studies that I like to point to is the emergence of cell as a journal. So, like, at least in bio, biomedicine, everyone talks about nature science cell, right? Um, and so, cell is actually a very new journal. They're only maybe 20, 30 years old. And how do they become so prestigious so quickly? They stay really laser focused on molecular biology when molecular biology was like blossoming, um, you know, 30, 30 years ago. Actually, their editor previously worked for Nature's attempt to launch a like molecular biology specific journal that 
failed for various reasons. And he's like, all right, well, I'm going to go start my own journal, sell, and just like do really fast, really high quality reviews. I'm going to work with all the top researchers in this new field of molecular biology. And that was essentially how they bootstrap prestige very, very quickly. And so there, I think there's going to be opportunities in like the new fields of like a lot of the crypto economic and cryptography that that's just flourishing right now because of uh, the attention and funding in the space. Um, I think meta science is just going to continue becoming more and more relevant. So I think there, there are a few pockets of new emerging research that will be opportunities. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the the and, cell discussion is fascinating. Um, yeah. the, 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 the person, actually the editor, kind of like bootstrapped it with his vast network of like really top uh, scientists. And he got them to actually, you know, publish work that were much more substantial than the smaller papers that were being made before, right? Uh, so there was, you know, some degree of, there's actually an interesting take of like the, the great man history, you know, great man theory of history, right? When it comes applied to, to papers, essentially the great editor, you know, story, right? And they've been like legendary editors, you know, in nature, you know, some of these, these journals that have, you know, truly left the mark as great editors, right? Great curators of science. Yeah, it's an interesting angle. And uh, hopefully we can use that as some fodder for our next uh, this community call that'll be focused on peer review where we'll dive into some of these topics. But for today, I just want to thank Darren uh, very much for taking the time to present. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation. I really uh, appreciated the conversation that came up. And thank you to everyone who asked questions throughout uh, and for whom this is a first call. So yeah, thank you all very much. And yeah, just uh, thank you uh, to Darren directly. Really appreciated it. Thanks, guys. Be well, everyone. Have a good rest of your Thursday.